Welcome, I'm Catherine Kangany, JHSM's Executive Director. We are so glad you can join us tonight for what's going to be a really interesting and important talk about Detroit's segregation wall. And before introducing tonight's speaker, I'd like to mention a quick point of housekeeping. Following the lecture, we will open the floor for Q&A. And if at any point in tonight's program, you would like to submit a question for consideration, please submit it using the chat feature, which, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Erin Einhorn is a Detroit-based national reporter for NBC News. Her award-winning work has uh, also appeared in The Atlantic, The Nation, The Washington Post, and the public radio program, This American Life. Previously, she was the founding editor of Chalkbeat Detroit, a nonprofit education news uh, site that covers educational equity. Before moving to Detroit in 2014, Einhorn was the deputy managing editor for politics at the New York Daily News. She is also the author of Pages in Between, a Holocaust legacy of two families, one home, published by Simon & Schuster. The memoir chronicles the year she spent living in Poland, getting to know the family that rescued her mother during World War II. And tonight she speaks to us on Detroit Jews, segregation and the Burwood Wall, Please join me in welcoming Erin Einhorn. Oh, thank you so much for that invitation, and and thanks to uh, you know to, to, to all of you. It looks like wow, seventy six participants. That's pretty. That's, that's a lot of people that come <laughs> to come here. So I'm I'm grateful for all of grateful to all of you for coming. Um, grateful to um, to JHSM for for inviting me. Um, and just I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. It's sort of weird. I'm feeling like sort of disoriented by like looking at a screen that that only has me on it. Um, <laughs> but I'll 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 try to I'll try to power through. Um, but I you know I think there's a really important conversation to have about sort of the legacy of segregation um, that we have in this country and and particularly you know, the, the, the role that the Jews have played in that and, and as it relates to this um, particular example in this particular city. So uh, I am going to see if I can, I practice sharing my screen. Let's see if it works. All right. And all right. Okay. Um, so that, so this is, this is a story that I, um, I co-published this summer uh, on NBCnews.com, and I worked with a, a local reporter as well from a local publication called Bridge Detroit. Um, and and the two of us uh, put together this piece. It was actually the the 80th anniversary of the construction of this wall, which was sort of roughly our news peg. But um, you know, the the origin of the story pretty much was it actually the idea for the story first germinated in the summer of 2020, so last summer. Um, you know, it was, you know, after George Floyd, there were a series of other sort of racial uh, viral videos. And I was really struck by how differently different people were viewing these events. Um, you know, the, the different lens through which we were all viewing these same cuts of video and, and, and racial difference was a big um, determiner in terms of how people were viewing these videos. And I was talking to my editor about it and I was like, yeah, of course people see this stuff differently. You know, we all grew up separately. You know, the vast, I mean, there's exceptions, of course, there's diverse neighborhoods, but for the most part, almost everywhere you go in the United States of America, almost every neighborhood is segregated. It's a white neighborhood, it's a black neighborhood, it's a Hispanic neighborhood, an Asian neighborhood. But for the most part, the people there all look like each other. And if they have kids, their kids all go to school for the most part with kids who look like them. They, you know, they grow up, their friends look like them for the most part. You know, obviously we all have exceptions and, you know, workplaces obviously are a different matter, but, but for the most part, we surround ourselves as Americans with people who look like us. And I, you know, I always heard this, you know, there's this myth that we that we we choose to live that way, that we want it that way, that, you know, white folks want to live with white folks, black folks want to live with black folks. And that's true to some extent, for sure. You know, you feel more comfortable with, with what you know. Um, but it's also true that, you know, there's federal policies, state policies, local policies that have been creating that segregation very deliberately for a very long time, probably since the birth of this country. And 
you know, the Burwood Wall is a literally concrete example of those policies segregating people, dividing people. And so we have this idea, you know, can we somehow reflect on everything that's going on in this country right now, this sort of very particular moment of racial tension in America by looking back at this one instance of this one example or this one act of segregation from 80 years ago and look at how this act of segregation from 80 years ago echoes through the generations from then until today through the and so we so we had the idea okay this wall was built in 1941 and you know can we find people who lived on both sides on either side of the wall around the time it was built and tell their stories you know the the and the stories of their children and their grandchildren in order to to reflect on where we are today uh, now, I know this is a Jewish historical society, and don't worry, I will get to the Jews. Uh, but first, I want to start with uh, one of the Black families I met, um, in, and, and one of the Black families whose stories I told in this piece, um, as a, a, well, mostly because they were there first. Okay, so I'm, let's see, hold on. All right, so there we go. These are, this is the Cruz family. So that's Bernice, Elizabeth, and John Cruz, and they were early settlers. So this neighborhood, so the Burwood Wall, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, where, with where it is, I think a lot of you are from that neighborhood, I understand, but it's nor we're, in, we're in Northwest Detroit. And uh, this particular family, the Cruz family, were, were among the first people to settle in the area. And they arrived in Detroit originally from Alabama around 1918. Uh, they were part of the Great Migration, so they were sharecroppers in the South, um, you know, experienced all kinds of difficulties and discrimination, et cetera, uh, and came up to Detroit 1918 seeking, you know, the big dream of the Great Migration opportunities, less discrimination. And the biggest dream that they had was a home of their own. So I know a lot about this family, in fact, because Bernice, the, the girl in this photo, later went on as a, when she was older and wrote a memoir. And in her memoir, she describes the dream as a real home using all capital letters with beautiful curtain and fine furniture. And, you know, they, and they, they just, they, they thought that if they came to Detroit where there were job opportunities, they could have this home. But like most black Detroiters, when they first arrived, you know, they lived downtown, they lived in Black Bottom, which is here. Um, and, you know, Black Bottom was, crowded uh they you know they had they had difficulty finding housing when they found housing it was in poor condition they had a landlord who raised their rent every month it was not the big dream that they imagined their life in detroit would be and they heard about a man who was selling land on contract to 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 black folks up beyond the borders of the city of detroit in what was then greenfield township and so they packed up their stuff, they get on the streetcar, they ride it up Woodward, they go all the way into Greenfield Township, and they have to walk for several miles, there's no transportation up there, and they get to this neighborhood, which was then called Detroit Gardens, and it wasn't crowded at all, it was actually rural, uh, it was largely unsettled, didn't have electricity, didn't have running water, uh, people who lived there were very poor. Um, they certainly couldn't get loans to, to build a house, you know, but they were, they were from the South, they were resourceful, they knew how to work the land. So they plant some garden and gardens and, and they, and they built shacks. And in fact, in her memoir, um, Bernice, well, Bernice Cruz, who, 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 Bernice Avery is her name by the time she writes the book, she calls the, um, the neighborhood shack town. And this photo, you can see the shack and this is, this is Elizabeth Cruz and behind her is one of the shacks in the um, in in that neighborhood, um, but of course they didn't want shacks. You know, we know they wanted real homes. They wanted loans to build those homes. But not only could they not get loans, they also had another problem, which was, you know, they weren't the only people in Detroit who had big dreams and who wanted real homes. So Detroit's population between 1910 and 1930 triples. There are train loads of people arriving in the city every day. Black folks coming from the South, white folks coming from the South, people coming from the East. We have, as we know, lots of Jews coming from Europe, Catholics coming from Europe, Protestants coming from Europe, all of them coming to Detroit 
in order to, to, to access the, the factory jobs, the auto jobs, the decent wages, the middle-class wages, and they all want housing. They all want a little slice of Detroit. Detroit doesn't have nearly enough housing. And so developers start making big plans. Um, pretty soon this area, Greenfield Township, is annexed by the city of Detroit and there and, and, and developers start making plans. So the super subdivision a tribute to the new Detroit, Detroit's wedge of progress. This was an ad in the free press in the 1920s when they were just selling land up in that neighborhood. And then this is the neighborhood. Now a developer gets a little farther. He calls the neighborhood Blackstone Park, Blackstone Park number six, the super subdivision with the big future. And he has big, big dreams for what this neighborhood's gonna look like. Um, and we can get a little bit from the from the text on this. We can get a little bit more information about what he thinks the neighborhood is going to look like, or who he thinks the neighbor, who he thinks is going to live there by scrolling down, by looking a little closely, and we see that this subdivision has the restrictions that bring demand for home sites. Now, by restrictions, they mean lots of things, right? There won't be big apartment buildings. There won't be farm animals. You know, all the sort of zoning rules and things like that that, that communities have. And as, as all of you or many of you I'm sure know, restrictions also meant racial restrictions. So there wouldn't be black folks there. And in a lot of communities, there wouldn't be Jews there either. Um, so they have big plans for housing. Um, and so this is the 20s, you know, they're, they're starting to build the housing, you know, the depression hits, that slows things down. But then uh, the depression you have, then you have the New Deal. You have the biggest boost for housing, probably in certainly in recent history, the big promise. So regular everyday working class folks could now afford to buy a house, the American dream, right? More and more houses are, are being built. And, and, and so this part, this newest part of Detroit is filling in really quickly. And there's houses coming from the East and coming from the West and coming from the South are all kind of moving toward this neighborhood where the Cruz family lives, Detroit Gardens, but this neighborhood, that Blackstone Park number six, isn't getting developed. The developer's having trouble getting financing. Why is that? Because of redlining. So that's not a surprise, but this is a map of Detroit in 1939. And as you can see, there are huge chunks of, that are bathed in red. So if a neighborhood is bathed in red during the redlining era, the, that meant the government considered your neighborhood a bad investment and almost no one could get a loan to buy a house there and if we zoom in on the neighborhood a little more to this part of if we, if we zoom in on the part of Detroit that we're looking at here we see this is the neighborhood where the Cruz family lives which is clearly bathed in red um, and the neighbor in this, in this neighborhood was considered a risky investment that's why they that's why the it was colored red why did the government consider it a risky investment? Well, here's, we can look at the documents that, um, so at the, you know, there's a project, University of Virginia has all these redlining maps online and they have the, the attached documents and we can see here some of the issues that they had with that particular neighborhood. So, so they, so this, uh, that could be one of the reasons. So here we have Blackstone Park number six. Now, the Blackstone Park number six is the gray area on this map. And as you can see, it's mostly outside of the red area. Um, and, you know, obviously the developer who has big plans for this neighborhood doesn't want the red to bleed over to his neighborhood. So in 1939, the developer goes around to everyone who owns lots. He owned a lot of them, but there were others who had bought lots and he gets them all to agree to a set of rules. And I found this set of rules, this three-page document in a dusty old Wayne County archive. Uh, and we look at the rules a little bit. And here we see on page, I think this was page two, limitations as to occupants. No part of said property shall be used or occupied in whole or in part by any persons not of pure, unmixed white Caucasian race. So that is telling us um, who, who the developer is building these these houses for. Um, but even once he puts that in, of course, the developer still can't get financing to build his neighborhood. Why? Because it's too close to the redlined area. So what does he do? You all came to this talk, you know the answer. He builds a wall. Yes. So that's where the that's where the Burwood wall is. It is, uh, whoops, 
it's also called the eight mile wall. Sometimes it's called the whaling wall. It is six feet high, four inches wide and runs for three city blocks. It's not a ghetto wall, so it doesn't keep anybody in. Uh, it stops at the cross streets. You can walk around it. So it's subtle in a lot of ways. It's in people's backyards, um, but it sent a clear message. And it sent a clear message to the people who lived in, in these houses, you know, to the, to the east of the wall. And it sent a clear message to the people who would buy the houses that were would ultimately be built west of the wall. Uh, and it and it it was enough for the for the FHA to approve um, housing loans, and so the new neighborhood can go forward. Oops. Uh, and then oh yeah, the new neighborhood. So here yeah, so this is just another picture of the wall, and then here we have the new neighborhood. So this is an article from the Free Press about an open house in Blackstone Park, and people start moving in now. I said I would come back to the Jews. And so now we're at the part of the story where Jews start moving into the neighborhood. Now it's not just news, it's not just Jews. This was a pretty ethnically diverse neighborhood um, in the sense of white ethnic diversity. Uh, so there's, you know, I looked at pages and pages of phone books, old phone books from this time, from the 40s and 50s. And I see, you know, French names, Irish names, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Germans. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons that Jews are in this neighborhood uh, is because, you know, if, as you recall, that deed restriction language, it, it, it required you to be Caucasian uh, and it didn't prohibit Jews the way similar language in other parts of the city may have done. So, and as an aside, those deed restrictions that they had in this neighborhood weren't theoretical. Right, so digging through the news clippings about this neighborhood, and I find this. Okay, so this is an article from the Detroit Free Press from 1944 about a woman named Nellie Bell, who had seven children and moved into this neighborhood around 1944. And she was a, a war refugee from China. Her husband was in a Chinese, um, was actually in a Japanese camp in China. Um, she was half Chinese and the neighborhood association found out she was there and tried to throw her out for not being white. Um, ultimately, she was allowed to stay actually after neighbors came to her defense, which was actually kind of nice to see. Um, and uh, but, you know, I interviewed her granddaughter who said that the incident shaped her family for generations. So she looks white and she said growing up, she was always told to never let on that she was Chinese because you know, people could treat her badly the way they had treated her, her grandmother. In fact, the, the granddaughter I interviewed is the daughter of the, the youngest child sitting in that photo. So in any event, getting back to the Jews, you know, so, so, you know, so, so folks are moving in. So lots, lots of people are moving in, a lot of the neighborhood moving in are, are, are Jewish. And you know, I, I've, you know, when I was working on this project over the course of several months earlier this year, you know, the Jews kept coming up in lots of conversations, you know, the, the black folks that I would interview, they would say, oh, yeah, you know, the, you know, oh, yeah, the, you know, the, it wasn't just white people over there, it was Jews, you know, and they, they were, they would, it was amazing, you know, on the Jewish holidays, nobody would be at school, they all, they all had that story about their empty classrooms um, on Jewish holidays, and, and I, I'm, I was sort of like, heartened to hear a bit that, you know, they said, well, you know, the Jews aren't as racist as regular white people, which, you know, I was like, okay, oh, thanks. You know, it's good to know that they, they felt actually they had pretty good relationships with their Jewish neighbors. But I'm thinking, you know, just thinking about, you know, this sort of moment in history, you know, people are moving here really mostly after World War II. The houses don't really get built during the war. And, you know, so, you know, the, they might've been Holocaust survivors, they might have been refugees who got out of Europe um, just before the Holocaust, just after the Holocaust. But for sure, the Jews moving into this neighborhood, most of them, we can imagine, had family, dear family, siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles, you know, back in the old country. And this is where they're living in this sort of lovely, clean, idyllic American neighborhood when the war ends and they start getting the news from back home. And, you know, and I'm just, you know, imagining just sort of visualizing that that sort of experience of, you know, of, of getting that news of hearing that news of, you know, of, or of trying to reach family back home and, and make contact with them. And, 
you know, the, the hopelessness they must have felt and the distance they must have felt and the just the sort of the strangeness of, of being so far away and being so safe in this sort of comfortable American place, you know, and, and, and here they are living in this neighborhood that was made possible by this racist wall. And, and for the most part, they didn't know that the wall was there. I mean, I interviewed, I think, eight or 10 white folks for this, um, for this piece who'd grown up in the neighborhood. Almost all of them were, Jew were Jewish. None of them knew the wall was there, even a couple of people who, who lived a block away had no idea it was there. Um, if they knew about it at all, when I called them in, in 2021, it was, you know, they'd, they'd learned about it five or 10 years ago. And, you know, and we're, and we're sort of shocked to learn that. Um, and, I, you know, and, I, and I'm like, you know, and in some ways, you know, this is the story of America, right? It's this, or it's certainly the story of the America that in my mind, you know, the 1950s wanted America to be, you know, these sort of idyllic neighborhoods where people come from all over you know, and yet, and, 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 and change their names and, you know, sort of Americanize with this idea that like, let's put this sort of fresh coat of paint over whatever painful past that you had from wherever it is you came from, you know, and, and, you know, you have this wall in this neighborhood that is built by the same racist forces that, that brought us slavery and Jim Crow. And yet here you have these folks, you know, Holocaust survivors or, or their, or Holocaust victims and their fam their families, you know, living in this neighborhood and in some ways, you know, benefiting from racist policies, um, you know, without even knowing they were there. So, you know, in addition to not knowing the wall was there, the folks I talked to also had no idea that they had restrictive covenants, you know, that there was deed restrictive language in their deeds that made it possible for only white folks to live there, you know, and, and, and because of that, they didn't, for the most part, or they hadn't given much thought to all the different ways that their lives, you know, their successes, their ability to go to college, you know, any money they might have inherited from their parents had been made possible by the racist policies that made this neighborhood possible. And to me, you know, I sort of was talking earlier about, you know, the sort of the racial moment where we're in today in 2021, you know, and how it is that we got to such this place of division and you know why it is we're seeing things through such different lenses. And I think it's, I think a big part of it, or certainly we can't discount the fact that so many of us are seeing this. We're not seeing, you know, we're seeing it through a different lens because we're not seeing the whole story. You know, we're seeing what we know, what our parents told us. If we're successful, you know, we say, well, you know, I got here by hard work, which is absolutely true. Very few, you know, if you're successful, you probably did get there by hard work. You know, nobody gave me anything. Are you trying to suggest that I have what I have because, you know, somebody gave me a leg up? But we don't always stop to think about how policies like the ones that made this neighborhood possible might have given us a leg up that maybe we weren't even aware of, right? So this neighborhood, uh, as, as most of you probably know, didn't stay segregated for very long. Walls built in 1941, but by 1948, the Supreme Court outlaws bars the enforcement of restrictive covenants and black folks start moving west of the wall. We interviewed a number of people who were sort of the, the first ones to, to move over there. And for the most part, they say they were, they were treated well um, by their neighbors. They didn't, nobody related any kind of story about, you know, being, being treated in a racist manner, which again was sort of heartening. Um, but pretty quickly, pretty shortly thereafter, the white folks, the Jewish folks, they move, you know, they move a little, little just other side of eight mile, they go to Oak Park, they go to Southfield, they start to move farther out to where I grew up in West Bloomfield. And when I asked people, well, why did you move? Nobody said we moved because we didn't like black folks. Nobody, I, I didn't hear that answer from a single person. They, you know, it was, we wanted a bigger house, more space, closer to family, closer to work, whatever it is. Some mentioned property values, you know, oh, you know, we didn't have a problem with them, but we knew maybe our neighbors did, we were a little bit worried. Um, you know, and by moving, they did protect their property values. So, you know, if you look at the average home price in Detroit today and compare it to the average home price in, you know, most of the suburbs, um, you know, you will see huge differences. The, the, pri the prices in Detroit are, are a fraction of those prices, um, you know, and that, you know, sort of just on that sort of idea of how that echoes through the generations, 
you know, my grandfather bought a house not far from this wall on Mendota, um, you know, half a mile south of it, just below seven mile, uh, you know, around around the time the wall was built. And, you know, he, he sells that house in the 60s, buys another one in Southfield. And, you know, when he sells that off, I think in the 80s, you know, ultimately he's able to pass money on to me and my brother and my cousins. And, you know, we all use that to, to buy property that makes it that makes our lives easier and our children's lives easier. And so you see that sort of intergenerational benefit of this wall from 1941. Um, you know, in my grandfather's case, it wasn't necessarily the wall, but you know, the restrictive covenant for sure. So I'm gonna wrap up in a minute, um, but I just wanted to add, you know, that when we don't acknowledge these advantages, you know, these little boosts that maybe we never considered and we, maybe we don't understand, you know, it, you know, that, that's kind of how we get some of our ideas about some of our differences, right? So if we compare a suburban neighborhood to a Detroit neighborhood, you know, why does one look so different from the other? So many of the folks I interviewed said, you know, oh, I love Detroit and it's just so sad what's happened to Detroit. You know, they see the blight or they, they look at the test scores or they, you know, they see the crime and it's just, I just hate what's happened to Detroit and, and I just, I, I want Detroit to get better. Um, but they don't acknowledge any role that they or their families or their decision to leave and take their tax dollars with them, you know, the role that that played in kind of creating some of these differences. So in kind of in writing the story, you know, one of the things I was, was hoping to, to really kind of bring to light was that. So in any event, before I close, I just well, I also want to quickly settle one thing about the wall. Is, which is this, and this is important for a Jewish historical society event, which is that this wall was not built by a Jew. And I don't say this lightly because when I first started working on this project, I spoke to a historian who'd actually written an entire book about the wall. And he told, and I, his, but his book doesn't say who built the wall. And I was like, well, who built this thing? And he said, well, he said it was, he was 95% certain that it was this, oop, this guy, Harry Slatkin. So Harry Slacken is a, is a Jewish Russian immigrant who came to Detroit. Uh, actually, I think here we have his, you can see his obit. He came to Detroit in 1909, right there. Here's our detail. Um, and he was you know, fleeing persecution in Russia and he built a housing empire. He built quality homes that regular people uh, could afford um, both in the city and then eventually out in the suburbs. And the reason that this expert that I spoke with thought that Harry Slacken had built the wall is because 12 years after the Burwood Wall is built in 1953, Harry Slatkin tries to build another wall in the very same neighborhood. So here's, I found, this was the only article I could find about the second wall. Um, but you can see that it says that the units on the east side of Wyoming between West Outer Drive and Pembroke, that's this blue area. And see, and here's the Cruz family, right? So here's his neighborhood and who's living over here? Well, I think we know. And we say, and this is, I just zoomed, I just zeroed in, I just blew up this little bit at the end. So he's building wrought iron fences and thick hedges that would surround the project. Uh, and he's doing this because the, the, the neighborhood across the way is such an eyesore. So now, and I know I showed you the pictures of the shacks, which surely would be an eyesore, but you have to understand that by 1953, those shacks were gone. The Cruz family and their neighbors weren't living in shacks. Actually, this is a fascinating story that I probably won't get into much unless someone asked me about it in the questions. But this was actually, there's this fabulous, this is fascinating story that occurs on the east side of the wall, the black side of the wall, where the Cruz family and their neighbors were just very effective activists. And they managed to get an audience um, with the head, the Michigan head of the, of the housing, federal housing um, agency or authority. And, he, and, and, Basically, they convince him to give them access to those federally backed um, mortgages and loans, and they're able to actually build um, really quality houses. And in fact, if you actually drive around this neighborhood, the houses that are east of the wall are extremely similar, if not possibly even better quality, at least, you know, that they appear to be now than the ones west of the wall. So it's not like, you know, you've got checks across the way. There's actually these pretty similar looking, um, you know, single family homes with nice manicured lawns and all of that. But for some reason, you know, Harry Slatkin and his and his and his 
his company think, well, if we're going to build here and we're going to build housing, we're going to need a wall. So, you know, in reporting this story out, you know, I really wanted to know whether was it Harry Slatkin who built the wall? So I contacted Mr. Slatkin's descendants. I talked to his, his great grandson and someone who worked for the family business, you know, back when the patriarch was alive. And they assured me, you know, Mr. Slatkin was no racist. He built houses for everyone. He had a diverse staff. You know, he, he didn't, you know, he, you know, his, he, he, he drew on his experience, you know, as a Jew and he was sympathetic. But regardless of his personal views on race, and I don't, I don't know one way or the other what his personal views on race were, but regardless of them, you know, he was a businessman. And he obviously had a reason to believe that putting a wall around these houses would help them sell better than not having a wall or, you know, uh, what was it, thick hedges and wrought iron fences. Um, now, so that second wall was ultimately never built. It was ultimately not approved by the city. Um, the houses went forward, but not the wall. But this wall, unlike the Burwood wall, actually didn't get built without comment from Jewish leaders. I actually found a reference. There's a, a reference to Slatkin and the second wall in this book, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, Metropolitan Jews, which is a book about the history of, of, of Jews in Detroit. So I reached out to the author of this book and I asked her, you know, hey, what do you know about Harry Slatkin and the wall? Because I was still trying to find out if he'd built it. And she went through her notes and she sent me a copy of a letter that Albert Meyer, who was a professor at Wayne State at the time, wrote to the Jewish Community Council in 1953 about Slatkin's proposed wall. And in that letter, he says, you know, he condemns the wall, saying it will antagonize race relations in Detroit. And he says that because Slatkin is Jewish, and I put this quote here, you know, he should be reminded that he doesn't have that many backward steps to take before he bumps into his own wall. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's not made of wrought iron, but it is exceedingly sturdy for it has stood for 2000 years. So, you know, it, it's connecting a lot of these themes about, you know, you have these Jews coming into this neighborhood, uh, you know, who, who's, who understood the consequences of racial and ethnic hatred and division, and yet, you know, trying to do the best they can by their families and their communities and their businesses and protecting their property values and protecting their investments at the same time trying to be ethical and good and 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 be good American citizens in in this country. Um, so, you know, I don't know if there's any particular moral to the story or the role that this one Jewish leader played here in calling out the actions of another, but if we know nothing else, we know at least that the Burwood Wall was not built by a Jew. It was in fact built by this guy, James T. McMillan, the wealthy grandson of US Senator James McMillan who represented Michigan around the turn of the 20th century. So I'm particularly proud of this because this took me months to solve the mystery of who built the wall. Um, records, I mean, you know, I'm doing this during COVID and records that are normally accessible in libraries and archives were just closed. And I would call, I was trying to call like the register of deeds in Wayne County for like months. And there's just, they can't go there. It's closed. They're not answering the phone, trying to get all these property records, trying to get all these business records. But I was eventually able to identify that Mr. McMillan and two of his sons are the wall, the wall's builders. Now this is, this is a very prominent family in Detroit. Um, they made their money. The family originally became wealthy in the 19th century uh, in transportation and shipping and railroads. And they didn't invest much in real estate, but in the early part of the 20th century, um, uh, you know, James T. McMillan and his sons start something called the Nottingham Land Company, which uh, were the developers of Blackstone Park number six. Uh, and they, the, I made reference earlier to that, you know, the, the deed restrictions, that, that three-page document that included the, the race language uh, and the first signature on that document was Mr. McMillan here. Um, so after confirming this, I went and I tracked down, I found, I think, 16 grandchildren or great-grandchildren of Mr. McMillan. And my, my editor said, well, I want you to call them all. And I was like, okay. So I spent like several days looking up all these people's addresses and phone numbers and email addresses and contacting them. And I probably interviewed four or five of them. And uh, several of them were, were pretty defensive, you know, wondering, well, what, you know, why are you calling me about this 80 year old thing that my, you know, grandfather did? You know, why am I digging around in ancient history like this? Um, but I, I, then I had an interesting discussion with, with one of the grandsons who's, who's still in the area, Sandy McMillan, who happens to be on the board of the Detroit Historical Society. 
And he was, you know, like his cousins, decidedly dismayed to learn this piece of news about his grandfather. But he, in the end, told me he was actually pretty happy. Well, I don't know about happy, but he was, he was, he was, he thought it, he said, he thought it was important that he saw that this was a story that was important that needed to be told. And he said, you know, with history, you learn from the good things and the not the good things, and you don't hide either of them. So that's what I'm hoping, you know, I, I was able to do in this project was to take the history, the good history and the not history and, and sort of put it out in the open to make people think a little bit and um, sort of really, you know, start a, a conversation that, you know, I, we've been having and need to continue having, um, you know, certainly going forward for, for some time to come. So I know there's a lot more to the story and I know I've talked for a long time. So I think I should stop talking and see if, um, you know, see here who, who has some questions. And thank you all for listening. I know you were all on mute and you had to listen, but you know, you know, maybe you're all off doing your laundry or something, but anyway, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs> thank you, that was terrific. Um, so one of the early questions that came in was with regard to schools. Um, you had mentioned that during the high holidays, uh, you know, the, the Jewish students were not in the classroom. Were, were these two neighborhoods attending the same school? No, no. I was actually, I guess I was conflating time a little bit. So at the time that the wall was built in 1941, if you lived, you know, so the, the new folks moving in to the houses west of the wall, um, the, most of the, the Jews mostly went to McDowell. And then at some point later, they built Werner, which is a little bit farther west that sort of captured the, the more westerly parts of the neighborhood. So, so the white and or Jewish folks went to McDowell or Werner. If you lived east of the wall, you went to Higginbotham. Um, and, and actually the, I mean, they, you know, and sort of, if you read the, you know, the, the sort of history of desegregation or uh, segregation or racial difference in, De in Detroit public schools, the differences between these particular schools, were, you know, it, it is rather notable. And in fact, at one point, um, I think in 1966, they actually tried to build an integrated school that would draw people from sort of both sides of the neighborhood. Um, but by 66, it was too late. And I think it was integrated for about a year or so until most of the white folks left. And then, you know, it's actually the buildings now Bates Academy. Um, but the, you know, when I was referring to like the, the Jewish holidays, these, these were, you know, we interviewed a lot of the, the black families that were the first to come over. So they would have moved over in the early fifties. So as the neighborhood is beginning to integrate those were the people who were. So these were these were some of the first black students to attend McDowell. That's where they were describing that um, dynamic. Great. So a, a lot of kudos for finding Macmillan are coming in over the chat. That is that is really a terrific piece of uh, of sleuthing there. So <laughs> yeah. a question came in about about credit. Uh, one participant asked, "Can you talk more about the role of credit and the ability to move quickly?" People in business have more access to bankers and credit then. I'm not sure I understand the question. So people in business have more access to credit and I think, I think the, yeah, I think the question is is with regard to to loans and and buying a home that mm -hmm. uh, that that certain people are extended credit and certain people are not. And what what role does that have, you know, in this larger story that you're telling about redlining and mm -hmm. segregation in neighborhoods? Well, I mean, certainly in the case of the home loans, you know, the, you know, the, you know, if you, if you lived in a neighborhood that was blue or green on the federal government's map, you know, then your credit would be reviewed. You know, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm by no means an expert in, in, in housing finance or any kind of finance, I can bear, you know, but they, you know, the, but, but the, you know, but the theory is, you know, if you, you know, if you lived in the right kind of neighborhood and you had the right, you know, kind of profile portfolio, when you apply for your, for your mortgage or your loan, I mean, the same as today, you know, you'd qualify. But if you, you know, if, if you didn't, if you were, you know, on the red side of the wall, they just wouldn't even look at the, look at the loan. I mean, and this hasn't, I mean, we still, you know, redlining itself was abolished by the Fair Housing Act. But, you know, you know, if you look at mortgage policies today, you know, it's still, I mean, I think, I saw a statistic from 2020 in the city of Detroit, three quarters of all houses in the city of Detroit were paid for in cash. Well, why is that? 
right? So if you try to buy a house in the city of Detroit today, and you try to get a mortgage for it, you know, the, the mortgage industry, which, you know, got appropriately, you know, swatted after the mortgage crisis in, in 2008 for like giving out all these loans, all these bad loans. So now if you try to get a loan in Detroit, you're told, well, that house is in really poor condition, you know, like the, the, you know, the, they, they, you know, they walk through and oh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's crumbling, whatever. You can't get a loan because the house is, needs to be repaired, doesn't have a roof or a furnace or something like that. And, you know, oh, it's, you know, that neighborhood is, you know, it's, you know, I, I actually 10 years ago tried to buy a house in a, in, in a neighborhood in Brooklyn where, you know, now all the condos are like million, $2 million condos. But at the time that I was trying to buy there, the only way I could get a mortgage was to agree to put down 25% because it was the mortgage company viewed it as a, as a poor investment because it was a, it was a declining neighborhood, you know, it was like, and it, this was like 2000, gosh, I can't remember, 2009 or something. There were no declining neighborhoods in Brooklyn at the time. And it was appalling, but it, you know, you see really clearly, like, if you don't have enough capital, you're not going to get that mortgage. And so what you end up having to do is, you know, what, what the folks in this, actually what people in Detroit are still doing, all these people buying houses in cash in Detroit, a lot of them are, are doing land contracts, the same kind of land contracts that the cruises are doing back in the 20s, where they're making a private deal. The owner says, okay, you know, you're going to buy me this house for me in installments. And, you know, it's like a, it's, it's a predatory loan. It's like the check casting place, only it's for real estate. So I don't know if I answered the question and I talked about a lot of things, but. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. And, uh, and Gay Tischler uh, comments that she lived in the Slotkin complex, the Sherwood Heights apartments for 14 years. And she says uh, when it was very highly integrated and she was happy to be a part of it, anyone could drive through, but now there's a gatehouse and non-residents cannot drive in. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the desire to put walls around our houses hasn't hasn't changed, I think. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so another uh, another attendee would like to know more about uh, the personal stories that you gathered from both the black and white families that you interviewed. I mean, you know, I mean, which it's you know, it was. I mean, was, you know, obviously there are all these individual people. I mean, I, I learned these like fascinating stories, you know, just about just like different things that happened to different people, you know, I mean, like there was this one um, white family that I talked to who were just absolutely committed um, to Detroit. And, you know, I was actually at one point I was trying to find students who had attended um, Bo Bobian Junior High, which was the integrated school that they tried to build. And I was like, oh, you know what? And I then maybe I'll do that for the next story. Come back and find kids who were in that inaugural class. Um, and I had talked to this one white family who's, you know, the, the, the parents had been really active in, in, you know, in bringing that making that school happen and, you know, just really believed in the mission. And, um, you know, and they stayed in Detroit until, you know, until 67. And then, you know, after the uprising, they saw their property values plunge. And, you know, that, that family, you know, I was talking to them, they said, you know, my father never bought a, another house again. He said he never trusted it. You know, he lost his entire savings because he, you know, he didn't want to be part of white flight, you know, and then, you know, and then of course, after that, they did move to the suburbs. And so they all ultimately are part of that, you know, that white flight story. Um, so, you know, when I'm talking about like, oh, you know, and I, and I don't mean to imply that, oh, if you're thinking about your property values, you know, that makes you a racist, but it doesn't, you know, it's a, it's, it's a practical decision. Um, but, you know, and here's this, here's this sort of counter example of this family that didn't make that choice. Um, but I mean, I, you know, there were sort of, it's just, it's kind of, you know, I, we, I talk to people about their jobs and their schools and their families and, you know, cause you never know where something like this is going to go. Cause I did so, I mean, this we spent six months on this project talking to so many people. Um, and then ultimately, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just the written piece. It was like a, I think it was like a 4,000 word written piece, which I've almost never, I'm almost never allowed to write that many words um, except for that book. But, um, you know, it was also, we did a, vi we did a video, we had, you know, the video team came, there was, it was a podcast on a show called uh, Into America that focuses on racial issues. So it was really just part of a, you know, it was a lot of different ways to kind of tell this story. Are you familiar with Susan Messner's novel, uh, Grand River and Joy? I'm not, but I'm going to write that down. 
<laughs> well, good. Yeah, I don't. So, someone else want to weigh in about that? <laughs> are you? Are, are you? <laughs> I, I am not, but it's come up in the in the chat uh, a couple of times. If you're familiar with this book. All right, I'm writing it down. So I will next time I if you guys invite me back, I can give you my book report on that. <laughs> yeah, Messer, M E S S E R. All right. So for so for those folks um, who are interested in in um, in hearing the podcast and watching the video and and some of the other ways that you have shared your research, where can they go to do that? Um well, so the I think is the is the link to the story in the um, oh you know what actually you know what did I let me take let me stop sharing hang on there we go all right there okay am I still sharing no. okay good um, so let me I can I, let me like look I, I mean if you if, if you find me on Twitter it's like it's 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 tied to the top of my Twitter bio um, you know or. You know, I, I mean, I can, I can, I can certainly hand the link to you, and you can distribute it that way. But it, but or That's basically, great. yeah. I mean, if you Google like NBC News and Burwood Wall, you'd probably not get the NBC story. You'd get, a, you'd get the, um, but it, it's, it's kind of a long um, link. So, but I can send it. I can certainly send it out. And it's, or if That's you go, to my, we'll, we'll make sure, we'll make sure all the attendees have it. Great. Yeah. Um, feel free to add more questions in the chat feature if you'd like to ask Erin anything while we've got her. How's your dad? <laughs> I want to know who asked that question. <laughs> That's from Susan Mozeev. How's your dad? Uh, I don't know. I was trying to get my dad to come. I don't know if he's on here. Maybe he can answer. I was, uh, you know. I, I was I was actually going to do this from his apartment, and then I could have, um, and then I could have just brought him on to answer the question. But um, I was going to go there because my kids are inside my house, and I thought for sure they would interrupt me. Um, but then I wanted to be able to have my monitors, which would have been tricky to bring to my dad's place. But as far as last I checked, he's doing great. <laughs> so, can you talk about the wall today, and particularly, you know, the the uh, move among the black community that's still there to to re to claim that wall and make it their own and make it something beautiful? Yeah, I mean, this is actually, I mean, the wall actually uh, earlier this year was named to the National Register of Historic Places. So, you know, there's been sort of discussions over, you know, recent years about, oh, should we tear it down? It, it now can't be torn down legally. It's a, it's a, it's a historic place. Um, it is now covered in really lovely, colorful murals. There's a section of it that used to have housing and um, or houses, and they 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 took they took the houses down and built this lovely park, which was renovated recently and there's beautiful murals. I think, um, you know, I probably should have had, a, 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 I had the, the historic photos in there. I don't, didn't put in any pictures of it today. Um, but today, certainly the section of it that if you go to see the wall that you're most likely to see is where this park is. You'd see all these sort of beautiful murals that actually, you know, there's Rosa Parks, there's different kind of, um, you know, historic moments, um, you know, in black history and Detroit history, you know, commemorated by this wall. And the walls actually become this real point of pride in that neighborhood. Um, they have this, this you know, huge picnic every August where you know the old timer old timers from the neighborhood all come back and they have you know barbecue and you know I you know I was I kept seeing when I was in the neighborhood and talking to people you know a lot of people have like T-shirts that have a picture of the wall on it. It's become kind of an icon you know, for their neighborhood, you know, and they're, and they, and they just recall their neighborhood, like eight mile, like they, when all my interviews are like, well, here at eight mile. And my editor was like, well, what's the name of the neighborhood? And I was like, well, they call it eight mile, but I don't think we can like, I mean, eight miles, a really long street. And, you know, most of our readers are only going to think of M&M, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> so who so doesn't live anywhere near this part of eight mile? <laughs> yeah. We've gotten a, a request to hear more about your memoir, but uh, before we get to that, could you talk a little bit about the role of realtors in blockbusting, um, in, in, in enabling uh, this, this kind of redlining? Yeah, actually, this is one of the women that we interviewed for the story, um, who was one of the first Black families to, to move over. Uh, I think she lived on Monte Vista, which is two, two or three blocks over from the wall. Um, this woman had moved there in... I want to say like 52. So she was really one of the first um, black kids on her block. And she has this really, really clear memory of sitting on her stoop 
and watching it was a she said it was a brother and sister team of real estate agents they would park at the end of the block and they would just work make their way down the block and they would knock on every door and encourage people to sell and they would offer to you know offer to sell the um you know offer to buy houses at, at, at you know relatively good rates and then they the realtors themselves would buy the property and then they would sell it to black folks and they can make you know they were selling it you know to the sort to the to the wealthier black folks who would pay a premium to be able to go live in that neighborhood um and you know and and that's you know so that's where this sort of this idea of the property value is is coming from you know everybody's sort of you know well okay i want to you know i love this neighborhood i love my neighbors i love the school my kids go to but you know, I don't want to be the last one here, right? So a couple people go, and then you know the blockbusters just move on to the next street. Um, you know, and then everybody's like, oh well, you know. And then it's also like, well, my friends are gone, I may as well go too. Um, you know, and then the same thing. You know, they move to Southfield, and then the same thing happens in Southfield, and then they, you know, Oak Park, and so hopefully we can, you know. So now I'm I'm back in Detroit. Uh, I, moved my, I moved here in, in 2014. I grew up in West Bloomfield, but, you know, made a point when I was moving back to the area of not moving out there that I wanted to sort of, so I'm in, I'm in Lafayette Park, which was Black Bottom. So the, uh, so I feel like I've come back to my roots. <laughs> Tell us about your memoir. My memoir. Yeah, my memoir came out in 2008. Actually, the, like the, like the day before the mortgage crisis, which is a terrible time to publish a, a book. Um, it was like the day before Lehman Brothers collapsed. Uh, anyway, it was a book, it was called the, the Holocaust, uh, what was the pages in between the Holocaust legacy of two families, one home. Uh, and I went to Poland, uh, lived in Poland for a year uh, and got to know the family that rescued my mother as a hidden child in a town called Bendin. Um, uh, and uh, Benjamin, uh, and they, and basically, I got involved in a ill-fated real estate deal um, with the family. Somebody, one of the one of the people on the call is a uh, is Michael Trace, and he's a he's a lawyer in Chicago who has very kindly advised me on my now twenty year uh, effort to uh, resolve this complicated real estate situation in uh, in Benjamin, and um, we're still going at it. <laughs> Here, 20 years later, uh, but you know, hopefully, you know, someday this shall be resolved. So, um, but yeah, it's basically the, I, I found the family that rescued my mother and I thought that they, I, you know, I assumed that they were going to be, they were still living in the house that my family used to own. And I assumed that they would be very angry to see me or concerned that I was there and would come after me. And in fact, I had this sort of extraordinary moment with um, the man, a man who had been, my mother was a, my mother was born in 1942. So she was a hidden baby and she was given to this family. And there was a 12 year old boy in that family who I met when he was an old man. And I knocked on his door and I showed him a photo of my mother as a baby with her father and a woman who my mother always thought was the woman who had saved her. And I showed him this photo when I opened the door and he started to cry and he, he points at the woman and he says, you know, Tomoya Matka, that's my mother. And, you know, and I pointed at my mother and I said, you know, Tomoya Matka. And then he just, you know, he took me and it was really, I mean, an extraordinary moment. Uh, it got messy after that, but we had that moment. <laughs> So and so, where can uh, where can people find your memoir if they would like to read it? It's uh, I mean, if you Google it, you should be able to find. It. I mean, you could go. I mean, you could go to my website, which actually I think I wonder if this story is there also. AaronEinhorn.com is my website. Um, for sure, there's a link to a, to the book on there, uh, and I guess it does not have this story on it. So you can read other stories I've written on other subjects. I will update my website. That's a good note. <laughs> Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, if you, you can get an Amazon or local, buy it from your local bookstore, uh, or, you know, um, you should be able to find it online. And if you can't let me know, and I can get a copy to you. So, uh, a question came in from Lori Lutz. She says, Aaron, I found your comments on Jews getting the news about what was going on in Europe in world war II 
while living in neighborhoods created on a foundation of racism very moving. Did anyone you talked to in writing this piece share reflections on that? No, honestly, that came from the book. <laughs> I mean, basically, I mean, and honestly, that actually came from, oh, yes, thank you, Harriet and Al. They were, my story was also on This American Life, my Polish, um, Poland story, so you could find it there. That is on my website. You could find that, erineinhorn.com. Um, no, I mean, honestly, that, that actually came from interviews that I did with my family. So, you know, my mother and her father were the only survivors from their very large family in Poland. Um, you know, so in, in, in researching my mother's story, uh, you know, I, I interviewed all of the older relatives on my mother's side of the family, and they were the people who got this call. You know, they didn't live necessarily in this neighborhood, but the stories are going to be very similar, you know, and they, you know, and I, and, you know, and these were by the time, you know, the people I was interviewing had been children at the time. And they said, you know, I just remember my mother, like, opening letters and crying, and she would never tell me why. And so I just remember thinking about what that, I mean, sort of, I remember hearing those stories from my cousins who were telling me, my older cousins who were telling me that story from my family, but I didn't sort of visualize where it happened. Like it, when they were telling me the story, you know, I was visualizing like my mother's description of, you know, her aunt Tilly's like sofa with the plastic on it that she had to sleep on when she first arrived from, from, you know, from the old country, you know, and so, and I was picturing like the, the crocheted tablecloth or something where she was reading the thing but I didn't picture like what did the street look like you know and then I see this picture and now I'm seeing like oh this is what Detroit looked like in the 40s and 50s this is where they're living when this is happening and like this is the the backdrop against this is happening so yeah that's very powerful uh, let's see. Uh, Aaron was able to find out information about the Burwood Wall um, more than numerous researchers who have who have worked on this for a long time. Yeah, she she has, and the, the Macmillan piece in particular is uh, is a huge find. So a very impressive piece of research there. Thank you. Uh, Thank let's see. So Michael Trayson says, reading the Detroit Jewish Chronicle during 1933 to 45 is an incredible exercise. Um, let's see. Um, given our ability to view it from today's perspective knowing what happened uh and and the contrast yeah yeah okay well aaron einhorn thank you so much this was a tremendous presentation and thank you all for your questions we appreciate it we'll get the link for the recording and also the links to aaron's research and where to find it out to you shortly thank you thank good night all thank you all so much i really appreciate it thanks for the great questions bye